So welcome. Um, this is our uh, presentation. We are from the uh, Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. Um, I am Beth Lathrop. I'm the director of libraries. Um, I have been a librarian for about 20 years, and uh, I've been working for the Strong uh, about five years. Um, this is actually my first non-library conference that I've been to, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, usually the wildest thing that happens at library conferences is there's people knitting during your session. <laughs> um, and the only cosplay that happens is librarians accidentally dressing up like a stereotypical librarian. So, um, um, so I have a lot of library experience. Uh, my video game experience began uh, when my family got a TRS-80 and I played Dancing Demon a lot. Um, then they got Zork and I protested because they weren't paying attention to me. Um, and then I played Perils of Rosella, so I loved games again. And uh, now uh, my kids ask me to play Rocket League with them, but I get motion sickness, so I have to stop. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Good. All right. I'm uh, Andrew Borman. I'm the digital games curator. I've only been at the Strong for just over a year now. I was a school librarian before I did that. Uh, my main job is really to preserve games, and that is not just physical games, but also thinking about our digital future. All of us probably have cell phones, and we know how much of a headache that is. Uh, I also work on exhibits, so we'll touch on that a little bit. I also created a small website blog called P2P Online about 13 years ago when I was in high school, and I preserved unreleased and prototype games, maybe Star Wars Battlefront 3 you've heard of, Halo Mega Blocks, a lot of things like that. And uh, now I'm at the Strong. So just a brief history of our museum. Our founder was Margaret Woodbury Strong. Uh, she was born in 1897, the only child to extremely wealthy parents. Um, so her childhood was spent uh, traveling between the East Coast and the West Coast for finishing schools. They also would take months off at a time to travel the world. Um, her parents were um, very into collecting, so she sort of inherited this love of collecting. Um, they used to let her bring one small bag on these trips across the world, and she, this bag had to hold everything that she, all the souvenirs she wanted, so she started buying miniature things. She was very smart, maximize your, um, your uh, collection there. So um, she was married and had uh, one daughter, and her husband and her daughter both uh, preceded her in death. So after they both passed away, her collecting really sort of took off. Um, in 1968, she secured a charter uh, for uh, what she called a museum of fascination. Um, she, uh, at that point, her collections were about a half million objects, including 30,000 dolls and 500 dollhouses. Um, she passed away in 1969, and at the time she was the single largest stockholder in the Eastman Kodak Company, which this was 1969, so that was a lot of money. Um, so she left uh, provisions in her will that a museum would be formed, and she sort of gave free reign to the Museum Corporation to decide the direction of the museum. So uh, the Museum Corporation uh, consulted with people like from Winter Tour, Colonial Williamsburg, and uh, the Smithsonian, and they analyzed the collections. And although they saw a lot of play and to toys and dolls and games in it, they said, said that that was probably not the most scholarly pursuit. So um, it ended up being, um, we opened to the public in 1982, and the, the focus was everyday American life from 1820 to 1940, specifically the consequences of progress, the rise of the middle class, and expressions of identity during the age of industrialization. That sounds fun. <laughs> it's delightful. Uh, so in the mid-90s, uh, the museum began to increase its programming for families. We uh, had a partnership with the uh, Sesame Workshop. We opened our Sesame Street exhibit. Um, in 2002, we acquired the Toy Hall of Fame. Um, and then in 2003, we officially changed our mission to the study of play in all its forms. Uh, we had an expansion from 2004 through 2006 where we added more exhibits, including a butterfly garden, um, and that's when we officially rebranded as the Museum of Play. Um, in 2009, uh, we opened the International Center for the History of Ele Electronic Games, which we call ICHEG, um, and we also started publishing uh, the American Journal of Play, which is our scholarly publication. It is available uh, for free online. 
So um, our mission now is to explore plays and the ways in which it encourages learning, creativity, and discovery and illuminates cultural history. Uh, we welcome over half a million visitors a year. Uh, and we are in the midst of planning, uh, of, we're in the midst of another expansion, uh, which will include a uh, 100,000 square foot exhibit space dedicated to electronic games. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's hard to wrap your mind around how big 100,000 square feet is, <laughs> but one of the, we're, we're basically splitting the space into primarily two different uh, areas. One is our World Video Game Hall of Fame. Uh, the World Video Game Hall of Fame was founded back in 2015. The goal wasn't just to highlight the best games of all time, plenty of people have done that, but to highlight games that are the most important games of all time. These are games that are chosen for their icon status, their longevity, their geographical reach, and their influence on other games, other forms of entertainment, and our culture as a whole. Uh, so far, there's been about 20 games uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame, including Space War, uh, which was this past year, Pong, Tetris, The Sims, Super Mario Bros., the things that you'd really expect to be in a world video game Hall of Fame. Uh, but with the expansion, we want to take this to the next level and give our guests an experience that you just can't get anywhere else, a new way of interacting with the games. In the World Video Game Hall of Fame, this is a concept drawing that we have. Uh, will it look like this? I can't say for sure. <laughs> but we're looking into all sorts of technology, be it new displays, uh, projection mapping, all sorts of things that may or may not come, but it's going to be something really amazing. But the other half of that is our immersive video game experience gallery. We want you to learn about the history of video games through playing video games. Uh, again, still very much in development right now, but think about escape rooms and how you're interacting with the space around you. Uh, moving around, exploring things that is more than just playing with a controller. Uh, we're really excited that uh, it should be opening in summer 2021. So we, we have a little while, uh, stay tuned, but it's going to be exciting. Uh, so the International Center for the History of Electronic Games, Beth mentioned it briefly. Uh, we collect, study, and interpret video games, other electronic games, and related materials and the ways in which electronic games are changing how people play, learn, and connect with each other, including across boundaries of culture and geography. Basically, before iCheg was established, uh, we had a very small video game collection. But realistically, as we all know, especially all of us in this room, video games are, if not one of the most important forms of play in the past couple of decades, but the most important form of play. So we're up to over 60,000 items and growing, and this collection includes games and their platforms, so you can play it on original hardware, uh, packaging and advertising, uh, publications, be it magazines, trade catalogs, and also personal and business papers of key individuals and companies in the electronic game industry. And we'll talk about all this stuff a little bit more as we go on. And this was just kind of how we wrapped our mind around collecting for video games. It's easy to say, okay, if we're collecting video games, we need the video games. That makes sense to all of us. Uh, but what about the producers? What can we learn about the companies that made these things? Uh, I'm sure Blizzard of the 90s is different than Blizzard of today. <laughs> but it's an interesting thing to be able to study not just the video game aspect of it, but also all the other materials that relate to it. Uh, but also the players. The players have changed over the years. And we want to be able to collect materials that players have created along with you know, the experience that we've had. And just play. Uh, we want to be able to study the play of video games. Uh, so this is a, a big long thing about how uh, our arcade and uh, electromechanical games think kind of pre-electronic uh, video games. Uh, so the collections of electronic and mechanical games serve the museum's mission through their display, and that's an important part of it, research and preservation, but also through experience of the games by guests and scholars, as is judged appropriate to the in interpretive goal and the item's condition. Uh, so this is just talking about, based on the item itself, we want you to be able to play the games. We are not going to simply stick these things behind glass and have you look at video games. We know that that's not the experience that you really want. <laughs> That said, uh, we have had to make uh, certain adjustments based on the game itself. So arcade games are designated on acquisition, so as we get it in, as either part of the general collection, meaning we could put that out tomorrow, or perhaps our restricted collection, which is very unlikely to ever go out, 
uh, based on their rarity, their replaceability, their redundancy, and historical significance. Uh, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because it's something that we just did. It's not that once something hits the restricted list, it's going to stay there forever. What's interesting is we've found that some arcade and pinball machines, they weren't making reproduction parts for them five years ago, but now we can get more parts. So maybe that'll actually become more available to people. So that's something that we're always constantly monitoring, because again, we want people to play. Uh, so <clears throat> this is the, the library team. Uh, we are, the library and archives are called the Brian Sutton Smith Library and Archives of Play. Um, so we um, have about uh, 200,000 volumes in our research library, and we are approaching 3,000 linear feet, um, over three terabytes of digital archives. Um, so we cover everything, um, primary and secondary resources, uh, so journals, magazines, trade catalogs, children's books, comics books, <laughs> um, business records, design documents, source code, um, pretty much everything and anything um, published and unpublished uh, relating to uh, dolls, games, toys, and video games. Um, so we divide our archives um, into sort of three categories. We have um, collections uh, about the study of play, and then we have collections about the objects of play, so the actual the toy or game itself, um, and then we have uh, collections related to um, electronic games. Um, so if this is, I'm on the left there, Tara is in the middle, she's our cataloger, and Julia is our archivist. Uh, so we welcome, uh, the Library and Archives is open to researchers by appointment. Uh, we welcome about um, 80 researchers a year. Uh, the museum awards uh, fellowships three times a year, um, and they are there. We have a couple of different uh, fellowships um, that people can apply for. You don't have to be an, an academic to research with us. Um, the fellowships are there um, to uh, so that people are encouraged to research with us by you know um, a modest stipend. Uh, but we, um, as long as you want to research with us and want to travel to Rochester, New York, um, you are welcome. Um, so we, um, people from around the country and around the world visit us. Um, some of the recent topics um, that people have uh, visited us to research are how jigsaw puzzles reinforce political, religious, and familial ideologies, uh, the emergence of modern intellectual property, and uh, Puerto Rican women and their experiences with Barbie. Um, so some of the speakers you've seen here at MAGFest have researched with us. Um, and it's really a unique research experience. Um, as you can tell just from the topics, um, you're, you're based in the library and you have access to the magazines, the journals, um, the archival materials, maybe the design, the design notes that somebody, you know, the designer used to develop the game. You can go down the hall um, to the iCheg lab and play the game on original equipment, we hope. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, with the person who was researching Barbies, I had the delight of every day a cart full of Barbies would come up to my library and I would get to look at that. So it is sort of a one-stop shop, um, all different types of resources that you can use at the same time. Yeah, and when it's coming to hardware, I mean, we have Apple IIs. You want to come play on an Apple II, we will set you up an original Apple II with a floppy drive and let you play it, so long as it's physically able to. Now, that could change 10 years from now, mm -hmm. uh, but we'll get into some of our other projects in just a minute. So this is kind of our segue into what the primary purpose of our preser preservation is going to be. We want to share with you some of the collections so you know what we're talking about, and you can see just what it means to have almost 500,000 objects in the entire collection. And also what we're doing to preserve those games, because it turns out that it's not as simple as just sticking something on the shelf and hoping that you know, 100 years from now, somebody's going to be able to access it. Uh, so it's a process, and I, I think you're going to like some of these items. Uh, so just a little insight into um, our uh our sort of philosophy of digitization. Um, we often get people visiting us and they see our things, so why don't you just digitize everything? Everything. And it's an expensive uh, prospect. So we've narrowed down um, our priorities to a little acronym, ac acronym there you go. RAVE. Um, so that covers um, RARE, which are one-of-a-kind items not owned by other institutions, such as our trade catalogs, our trade sheets, um, design notes, uh, source code, game builds, um, iconic documents, um, at risk, 
are items that are threatened by deterioration or other preservation issues. Um, you know, born digital files created and saved in proprietary formats. That's a big one. Magnetic um, media. Magnetic oh. media. Um, <laughs> and other things that shouldn't be handled due to their uh, condition. Valuable uh, are items that document important historical events, social trends, or are otherwise culturally significant. And that's not necessarily monetarily valuable right. either, so there, there is a differentiation there. Um, and the last one is engaging, which are items that are visually compelling, fun, recognizable, iconic, um, and so that's our sort of our priorities of what we're uh, going to digitize. Yep. So I want to talk a little bit about arcade preservation, just because it's so unique to the museum and that we like to put these things out. Uh, so arcade cabinets are museum artifacts, but they're used. So we call them use effects because you're going to play them. Uh, we try not to kind of apply some of the quick fixes that an arcade operator may have done back in the day. We're not going to hack up the harnesses if we can help it. Uh, we want things to be sustainable. We want this to be a fix that's going to last as long as humanly possible without causing any more issues down the line. Uh, so this image actually shows, I think it's Hillary in the picture, I, I can't. Uh, she is working on repairing one of our electromechanical games, uh, which is, she's trying to fix some of the wood that had started to come apart, because I think this game is over 70 or 80 years old. Uh, so she's using glue that is safe for long-term preservation. It's not Elmer's glue that you picked up at the store. Uh, so electromechanical games, if you haven't really seen one, are a really, really important part of gaming history, but they have a lot of move, moving parts inside that make them extremely hard to maintain. Uh, so every major change that we do is written up so that we, we recognize that someday we may not be at the museum, so somebody needs to have a log of what was done and why it was done and how it was done. That way we have something to work off of. Uh, so that is one extreme case, but then we have something like this where it's Mario Bros. It's something that you've probably seen. I know the last panel had a, a quick video of uh, Mario Bros. on it. Uh, whenever possible, we do want to keep the objects original, but the fact is that sometimes things have been drilled into, things have been pulled apart, and there's just nothing left to save. So we do have to occasionally make our own control panels. Uh, so when you think museum quality, you kind of think that this, this thing should be pristine no matter what, but that's not kind of how we do things. If we can avoid doing this, we will. If there's cigarette burns on an arcade machine, that's part of its history. If there's a sticker on it that says that it was in a Rochester arcade or, or establishment, we want to keep that thing because that adds to it. It doesn't take away from the object in any way. Uh, <coughs> But sometimes you can't just go out and buy a reproduction uh, control panel in art. Uh, this is a game called Hoop It Up. It's a very physical game where essentially you're shooting ping pong balls into the net by pushing down on a basketball. One of our most popular arcade games that we have out right now to play, but when we got it, uh, there were no nets that were actually you know, decent to look at. Uh, and it turns out nobody is making mini basketball nets for Hoop It Up. So we actually made our own hoop it up nets as close to the original as possible because that is the only thing we could have done. And if we somehow found a hoop it up with the original nets that we could take them, that is easily reversible. Uh, but sometimes even that's not enough. Uh, so this is a game called The Flintstones. It's a pinball game. You probably recognize The Flintstones. Uh, but there's an issue with the Flintstones. Basically, the flippers are oversized, and they're reversed. Uh, and this wasn't a company that made a lot of pinball games either, so they weren't very good at it, to say the least. Uh, so when we got our machine, the, the flippers were essentially broken. So what do we do? We go out and we try to find the original flippers if we can. They're not out there. So we go to the manufacturer, we say, hey, do you have any? No. Do you have the molds I use to make them? No. Do you have the, the, the schematics so we can go out and manufacture our own? No. So we had that choice. We could just say, okay, this game is going to sit in our storage area for a while, or we can do something about it. So what actually we did was we 3D printed, and not with a home consumer 3D printing device, but actually designed uh, new flippers uh, so you could play this game. And it's been out so you can play it. But we did it in a way that there, there's a lot of different plastic 
chemical properties that I'm not very good at, but our conservator Hillary is, where basically they'll off-gas and damage the plastic. So we had to choose a plastic that not only doesn't damage the Flintstones any more than it already was, but it also it had to play the same. It turns out you can't just print a block of plastic and say, okay, this game plays the same as it used to. We had to modify the internal structure and make it actually functional, not just looking nice. Uh, so 3D printing is something we're exploring for a few other games because as you go back in time, you just can't get those unique parts. Uh, and it's something we're going to see more and more often as we go on. And then, of course, there comes the digital. This is one that uh, we picked up. You, you may not have heard of the game Invisible Monsters, but you may have heard of a game called Wizard of War. It, it's an old game. A lot of people like it. But this is a prototype version, one of a kind, that nobody else in the world has. Uh, and based on the fact that it's in our restricted collection, you can't just go out and play this on the floor because it is not meant for that. Uh, so what we've done is we've backed up the ROMs, like, because digital preservation is so incredibly important to all this stuff. We recognize that this is one of a kind. If it fails, that's it. So at least we have a backup of it, of it. And now I've gone one step further and started to implement it into MAME. Uh, so this is an early version of, of it being implemented. There's a star field effect that's currently being applied to the whole screen. It's not supposed to be. But right now, this game is playable on an emulator at the museum uh, where it may not have been otherwise. And now going forward, we can also say, okay, the boards inside this machine aren't actually the unique thing. It's the ROMs that are unique. Can we build a reproduction of this to actually let people play the prototype in some way? That's still a little ways off. Uh, but it also brings up just the question of digital preservation in general. I, I talked about the mobile games in the past. How are we going to preserve mobile games? How are we going to preserve games on Steam, things that have servers to go with them? This is easy. You back up a ROM and you're done. But with those games, there is no easy solution. We try to avoid DRM. We go to GOG.com. We'll go to Humble Bundle, itch.io, whatever we have to do to try to get DRM-free games. But the fact is that, you know, yes, yeah, somebody is going to emulate World of Warcraft. We get that. Is somebody going to emulate Motor City Online, which was one of the first ever uh, racing massively multiplayer games? By all means, the answer seems to be no. Uh, so we're currently exploring ways of how we're going to preserve digital games in the best possible way. Yes, we're backing up you know, Pokemon Go, but we know that's not the experience. What happens when GPS doesn't exist anymore? You're never going to be able to play Pokemon Go. Uh, so that's something that's a long-term goal. Hopefully, we'll be able to give another presentation about uh, server things in the future, but uh, we're just not quite there yet, unfortunately. Um, so here we're going to dip into um, just a snapshot of one of the collections that we have. Uh, we have the Carol Shaw papers. Um, so this is a compilation of her uh, game design documents, notes, sketches, uh, source code printouts, advertisement, and other um, ephemera. Um, the bulk of the material is uh, from um, between 1978 and 1984. Um, the great thing about this uh, collection is that um, in her documents, um, so uh, Carol Shaw is uh, most known for uh, River Raid, uh, but she also um, created the um, one of the first games ever designed by a woman, which is Polo. Um, it was unreleased at the time. Um, she developed it in 1978. But in her design documents, um, there wasn't, you didn't really have an editing program that could mm -hmm. handle creating the code. So it's hand coded, hand sketched, um, and then they would then use their, their handwritten documents to then uh, create the code. Um, so this is one of the first collections that we got as part of our Women in Games um, initiative that we'll uh, talk about a little later. Mm -hmm. And just so you know, that is the printed source code for Reverie. the Atari 2600 version of Reverberate, but it's on reams of paper that are all yeah, connected to each other. So it's a really accordion. interesting collection. Yeah. And of course, our handwritten notes, I think, yeah, are that's really cool. Yeah, for 3D... Tic-tac-toe. Uh, uh, Tic-tac-toe, yeah. yeah. All right, Skylanders. This one's a new one, but it's also exciting because Skylanders, if I gave this talk two years ago, we'd be having a different conversation. Uh, there was no big Skylanders game this past holiday season. I don't know if you even noticed that, but it's true. Uh, so this is exciting because the market's cooled a bit, and there's always a concern, especially with something so physical, that the materials are going to disappear. One of the ways that gaming has preserved things over the years is picking things out of the garbage. We'd rather not do that. 
Uh, so with Skylanders, we were lucky that we actually had the, the opportunity to work with Toys for Bob and with Activision to preserve Skylanders now before it hits the trash in any sort of way. So what we've done is we've been able to preserve early prototype models. Some of them are handmade, hand carved, made out of clay, 3D printed. So you can follow the progression, not just the design uh, changes that were made to the characters, but also uh, how they were able to change it so they could actually manufacture millions of these things. One of my favorite objects is actually right up here in the corner. It's a, a paper bowl that you'd use for camping or if you're lazy like me, just to have cereal out of. Uh, and alongside it is a board. When, when I wasn't there, but when Jeremy and I think JP were there, uh, they saw this bowl and were like, why is somebody's bowl hanging out with all these computer chips? But it turns out this is one of the very first portal bases that was made for Skylanders. So that's, they place a figure, it wasn't a figure at the time, on top of this paper bowl, and that was the first interface for Skylanders. And not only did they preserve all these physical items, but they also were able to do interviews with the people that are still at the studio today. So they were able to get the stories of why this paper bowl was so important. We don't have to guess that, okay, it was probably this. So we have a few hours of footage of all the people that were involved with creating uh, Skylanders actually talking about that process. It's a really cool collection. Uh, so I mentioned uh, this before, um, we have an extensive collection of trade catalogs. So uh, trade catalog is uh, what was sent from the manufacturers to the um, department store purchaser or the toy store owner. So um, we have a collection of about 30,000 trade catalogs from the doll toy game and video game industry. Um, it is, as far as we can tell, the largest collection of its kind anywhere. Uh, these were extremely uh, ephemeral, so you would purchase out of it and then you'd toss it. Uh, we ha are fortunate enough to have a, a number of donors um, from the industry who have, who have given us their trade catalogs. So, um, this is, uh, there's a lot of information that you can get from these. Um, it talks about what um, uh, materials were used to uh, produce something, how much it costs, um, and it clues into how it was going to be marketed. Um, and we, you know, have our collection, I think our oldest one is from, from the 1870s, and we also have um, trade catalogs through um, 2018. One of our favorites is the Mr. Potato Head catalog from 1965 over there. Um, <laughs> he's chasing little children, what's wrong with that? Um, and uh, similarly, we also have an extensive collection of trade sheets and arcade flyers. So uh, a lot of researchers come to us and, and use these. Um, a lot of times, especially the trade catalogs, these are companies that no longer exist because nobody bought these things. Or <laughs> even if it was in the trade catalog, none of the uh, store purchasers bought it, so it never actually made it to market. So it really uh, helps us because as a museum, we cannot have every toy, doll, and game that's ever been produced, and this uh, provides, um, the fills in the gaps in uh, the physical collections. All right, so gotcha. This is an arcade game. Uh, we, of course, we talked about how we collect things. We have the arcade machine, we have the arcade flyer. You notice that Arcade Flyer is probably one of the things that this game is most known for because it wasn't a standard joystick of any kind, and I'll let you look at that later if you'd like. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that was so iconic about the cabinet itself was the, the bezel and the, the control interface. One of the items that we received last year, I think through a donation, was the wooden mold that was used when they were vacuum forming the actual uh, controls. So that is something that is so incredible that like, I was excited to see that when it came in. Um, so this, uh, I've known this is a record for the number of times that Her Interactive has been <laughs> mentioned, but uh, a lot of the researchers um, come to us and one of the, the um, sort of gems of our collection are the, uh, the focus group data that is available in um, Her Interactive uh, uh, for example, 1998 Secrets Can Kill, or Interactive uh, did the, does the Nancy Drew games. Um, and also in our Atari coin-up collection, uh, we have some focus group data from um, Asteroids. So focus group, uh, uh, they show what uh, questions the companies were asking of their players, um, how the players were responding to the game as it was being developed. Um, also, especially her interactive, um, touching on 
the broader um, sort of social concerns. Um, her Interactive is one of my favorite collections because they actually, in order to solve, you know, solve the quote-unquote mystery of what uh, girls wanted out of video games, they formed a teen advisory panel and actually asked girls what they wanted out of video games. Um, so these are, are great resources and are, are one of a kind. And it's always interesting looking at these, like, because some of it is incredibly obvious, but some of it is actually like really interesting, just mm -hmm. how they were perceiving things and how wrong the adults were about <laughs> yes. how the kids want to play games. Uh, so video game capture, this is where we say that uh, essentially the hardware is going to die someday. There is only so much we can do to replace capacitors, replace chips, without going out and engineering more of them. We're just not doing that. Uh, so rather than waiting until they're almost dead, uh, this was a multi-year project resulting in footage that was captured from thousands of games in our collection on the original hardware uh, as it was meant to be played as much as humanly possible. Uh, this is something that is extremely valuable to researchers who maybe, you know, we take for granted that we're all okay at video games to some extent, but some researchers <laughs> have never played a video game before. They said, I've never played Pac-Man, can you show me what it looks like? There you go, we have footage for it. Uh, and it's also interesting when we start having other companies contact us saying, hey, you know, do you have footage for this, this, and this other game that we can use in some way? So this, this footage is maybe not as used today as we, we might have thought it would be, but 20 years from now when the hardware is dead, this is going to be the living record of what the game is like. And it's a great reference for things like emulators because not all emulators are accurate yet. How can you ha know that? Go and watch the footage. Strategy guides. Strategy guides. So um, another uh, part of our collection is uh, our strategy guide collection. Uh, we actually got, um, in uh, 2010, uh, Prima donated a lot of their game guides to us covering um, PC and console games from 1990 through 2009. I'm um, going to interrupt for a second. And I believe they just announced they were shutting down, right? Yes. Yeah. So maybe so, we'll get some more. So it's always interesting that we have this collection, yes. and it's here. You don't have to worry about the fact that they're gone as yeah. things, but we have We've it. Got Sorry. It. <laughs> it's okay. It, it is unfortunate. It yeah. is. Um, so these guides obviously document user experience, and um, they have screenshots. They'll have a description of play. Another way that we can sort of fill in the gaps if there's not an existing game that you can play, mm -hmm. this, um, these guides uh, help with that. Um, some are also, you know, works of art in themselves, The Prince of Persia, um, there's uh, Legends of Zelda Phantom Hourglass Collector's Edition that is just incredible. Um, we also have one, um, this um, Half-Life for Dreamcast, uh, this was you can tell a, I picked that one out. a strategy guide. Um, we have a strategy guide, but the game actually never came out for Dreamcast, so this is what the proof of, of what it would have looked like and played like. Okay, so we're going to talk about floppy disks because that is obviously what you're all thinking about. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think 2017, uh, we received a, gr a grant through the Rochester Regional Library Council, and the goal was that the Strong seeks to demystify the daunting aspects of digitization by establishing an efficient, scalable, cost-effective model for identifying and assessing endangered media at the point of acquisition, converting and preserving the content to ensure future uh, access. Obviously, that's part of the rave thing. These are at-risk media. We know that floppy disks are not around anymore unless you're a foon on Twitter. Uh, these are such unique items, and we're not even talking about retail floppy disks. We, uh, this pilot project was meant to image 100 floppy disks out of our archival collection. Uh, and that's all of them. That's our Atari collection, which you'll hear about, Jordan Mechner, who made Prince of Persia, Brian Fargo, who uh, founded Interplay. Uh, so the goal was 100. It turns out we were wrong on how long it would take to digitize these things, and so we imaged 1,756 of them. Yeah. Uh, and the success rate was nearly 100% in that we were able to image them. That doesn't mean that the data is the same as it was back in 1983, but it's, the same, it's as good as it gets for 2018, which is all we can ask for. And on that, we found lots of things. I'm gonna focus on the bottom image first. Uh, have any of you heard of a game called Marble Madness before? It's down in the arcade, I think, so you can play it. They were making a second one called Marble Man, Marble Madness 2. It did not come out, a common trend with me. Uh, 
while we don't have the, one of the few surviving prototypes of it, we do have the floppy disk with the, the CAD drawings that show how they were going to manufacture this. And this is like the, the best shot of it showing like the whole cabinet. Some of it goes down to what the individual screws would look like to put the thing together. Uh, the top image, I don't know if you've ever heard of a sci-fi book called The Moon is a Harsh Mistress back in, I think, the 60s. Uh, popular book about, you know, poor, poor treatment of, prison, uh, of the prison colony on uh, the moon. And you, you kind of inspire this uh, revolt. Well, it turns out Interplay was making a game based on the moon as a harsh mistress. And if you search the internet, at least pre-last year, you'd find two sentences about the fact that this game was being made. That's it. That was all that was out there on the internet. From Brian Fargo's papers, we have a demo version of the game, uh, which you can tell there's no graphics in the upper left-hand corner. It seems like it wasn't there. It doesn't seem like it was corrupt. And you can play through a part of the game. Uh, it's a Windows DOS-based game, or DOS-based game, not Windows. Uh, but what was also in there is the source code for the game, which we don't have the tools to compile it, but it notes why it's a demo version, too. It turns out that the game was so large that they, they just physically couldn't compile it on the machines that they had at the time, uh, which is a story that we would never know if we only had a floppy disk. And we also have the design documents and contracts to go with this game, too, so it's really, really cool. Um, so we also have in our collection uh, gaming magazines and also fanzines. Um, hopefully some of you attended uh, Michael's program yesterday on the fanzines. Um, so in um, uh, 2017, Chris Kohler uh, donated a collection of about 350 fanzines to uh, the library. Um, so in case... Uh, you're not as old as me, a fanzine was <laughs> really the thing in the 90s and whatever you were geeking out on, you would write your own little magazine, you'd send it to all your friends and they would send you theirs. Um, so these are, are great um, windows into gaming culture. Um, and we also have an extensive collection of the uh, sort of professional uh, gaming magazines. Um, so, and it ranges from you know the 70s through the present. So you've got everything uh, for how the industry was changing, how the technology was changing. You know, console wars, like every you know everything you would want to see. We also have. Um, a lot of Japanese gaming uh, magazines as well, uh, Famitsu. Um, and we also, uh, because of our mission, uh, we also <coughs> have um, things like pl a replay and play meter um, because of our, um, our foray into uh, pinball. So, yes. um, it which was just is, inducted into the Toy Hall of Fame. Was just pinball, inducted into the Toy Hall of Fame. Which is also in Rochester. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so again, this is heavily used by researchers and um, uh, it's really, uh, especially the zines are, are one of a kind. Okay. You open with this one. I open with this one. <laughs> so in 2014, a tractor trailer pulled up to the museum and unloaded about 40 pallets of um, materials that was essentially the remaining corporate archive of the Atari coin-op division. Uh, so in that one day, the size of our archives doubled. <laughs> Um, and we um, ended up hiring a full-time project archivist who worked for about 18 months uh, to process um, the collection and make a, a finding aid. So um, it's about 600 linear feet of materials and it's um, you know game development documentation, the focus group reports, cabinet artwork, uh, cabinet assembly drawings, schematics, technical documentation, corporate memos, patents, financial reports, uh, cell sheets, uh, photographs, and lots and lots of magnetic tape. Essentially, whatever was left at Atari when they closed down, that was what we have. <laughs> so, um, and uh, we have, um, if you're interested in seeing some of the photographs, we have a, a collection on New York Heritage, so you can browse through some of the photographs. Uh, my, well, I just want to talk about the, you know, some of the schematics and assembly, cam assembly drawings, which I'm sure you'll touch on, yep. is that sometimes, especially in the preservation aspect of things, if we need to recreate something, sometimes the, sure. the schematics or the cabinet art is the only way that we know how something originally looked. So um, that is another value to the museum besides to, to researchers for this collection. Right, thinking back to the Mario Bros. cabinet where we showed the control panel with the reproduction, I don't know how that one was made, but a lot of them were made by scanning them and recreating them in Photoshop and doing whatever you have to do. 
but we actually have, not for Mario Bros, I don't think, but for other games, uh, the actual different color layers of, and the colors that if we went yeah, and got them printed, we would have an exact, exact replica based on how Atari made it. I want to point out this drawing up here. It's probably a little hard to see. Uh, but the story, I believe, goes that Capcom, you know, the company that made Street Fighter, went to Atari and said, build us Street Fighter. Atari came with this drawing. Instead of a joystick and six <laughs> buttons, it is actually pads that you would physically beat on to fight each other. So these are some of the only surviving drawings of what their Street Fighter Deluxe cabinet would have looked like. Uh, and of course it goes on. We have yeah. a lot. Just on it, that's my, my favorite picture um, is the guy at the, at the pool, at the lake party. <laughs> the, <laughs> um, you know, office party. He's blowing up the raft for, for lake, the lake. So. There, there are so many interesting things. Some of them are probably not appropriate because Atari back in the 70s and 80s is Atari back in the 70s <laughs> yeah. and 80s. But if you want to know about how that company worked, this is where you'll go to see it. Right. Endangered media, more of it. So we have another pilot project this year. And it's not for VHS tapes, which would be easy. We are jumping straight into Umatic tape. So if a VHS is about this size, a Umatic tape can be about this size. And they're much older than that. Uh, and they make scary sounds when you put them into the, the player. Uh, so our goal is to digitize uh, 2,000 minutes, because we, we can't say that how long these things are, uh, of footage from our Umatic tapes. The only data that we have, other than a few that we had digitized privately before this, is what's written on them. And it's not a whole lot to go off of. Not a lot of information. So some of them say <laughs> Roadrunner on it. Atari was making a Roadrunner game, and they did put one out, but they're also making a Laserdisc game. So is this the Laserdisc footage? Or is it just a cartoon of Roadrunner? We won't know until we digitize <laughs> these minutes. I think that's part of what makes it so exciting. And, it, and the goal isn't just to digitize 2,000 minutes. It's to create a process not by which we can digitize things, or not just us, but also other people can learn to digitize pneumatic tapes right. because we know that we're not the only ones with it out there. And of course, there are CDRs. Uh, we are lucky to have many, many thousands of CDs in the collection. And one of them is a collection of primarily educational games, which if you're a big fan of those old CD-ROM games, again, there's thousands of them, some of them you've probably never heard of. Uh, so between that, between our Broderbund collection, uh, it's unrivaled, and of course they're not all in English either. If you want to play Carmen Sandiego in a different language, we have that. Uh, but among all those things, because one of these companies was reviewing uh, games and saying, hey, you should buy this one or not buy this one, uh, there's beta review, there's alpha copies of all sorts of things, which I've started to identify because they're just kind of in with the other games right now so that they can be digitized in the coming year or so. Uh, you can see a copy of Lunar uh, Eternal Blue, I believe, is that one, which is an early translation copy. Uh, there's games like Animorphs, there's Barbie games, there's all sorts of other things. But another collection that we have actually came from somebody who was working on uh, drivers for PC hardware back in the mid-90s. So, of course, if you're a big company making that sort of thing, uh, or a game, you want your game to actually work on the computers that people have to, uh, in that day. And one of them was a disc of System Shock, the first-person shooter game. If you know anything about System Shock, it's been re-released, the source code is out on the internet, but there's one key piece missing that nobody else has, and that's this. This is the map editor that they used to make System Shock. For some reason, they sent this game to this person who was working on making drivers and that sort of thing, and on, it, on this first build, of, I think, or second build of the CD version of System Shock is the map editor. Something the developers don't have, but we're lucky enough to have. And if you want to play it, feel free to come to Rochester. <laughs> uh, yeah, Night Dive Studios. We, we've talked to them a little bit, but there's all sorts of things with that. <laughs> Uh, so another collection that we have um, related to game design is the Will Wright papers. Um, so the basis of this collection are um, nine of his uh, game design notebooks. So SimCity 2000, SimCopter, The Sims, and Spore are some of the games. And early Spore, not the Spore that we got either, so the good one. Spore, <laughs> uh, the spore that exists in Will Wright's dream. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, so again, this is one of our um, more, more heavily used uh, collections, and it's you know the it's handwritten notes, and uh, there was what was the thing. All right, so there's, there's a few things me? about this. Will Wright <laughs> is an extremely interesting person. Yeah. If you haven't seen Game Informer, just did a great interview with him, and they actually talk about this because Game Informer came and visited us and saw these. So you'll see things like this, which very much resemble what you saw in The Sims. You know, the mood: are you hungry? Are are you comfortable? Next to that, you may see a note saying, hey, call up this person. Hey, this is my grocery <laughs> list for the week. But one of the things that he's working on is what sort of professions would people want to play as in The Sims? You know, politician maybe, uh, uh, game designer. And then he's going down, and then there's one with a question mark next to it that shows just how uncertain he was. It said, serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a brief, maybe it was only a second in time, where, where Will Wright said, you know what, people in The Sims, they should be a serial killer. <laughs> uh, have any of you been to Mega Manathon going on? Yeah. Right, they're raising money for child's play. The idea is to get video <laughs> games into the hands of children who are in hospitals. It's not a new idea, and I don't want to discount what they're doing, because it's awesome. But it's been around for a while. So this is a, called the Starlight Nintendo Fun Center. It's a, essentially a hospital cart. Inside is a VHS player and a Super Nintendo, uh, which still has the original games in it and the movie. It had the Lion King in it, if you're interested in Super Mario World. But they would wheel this around the hospital room so that children could play video games and make them feel, as, feel like they're normal, you know, feel like they can get away from whatever they're going through. And I just think this is interesting from that point of view, and also from the point of view of conservation. What do you do when you get an object in that was in a hospital for years and has potentially biohazard material <laughs> on it? Uh, but this is an important thing to show that gaming is for everyone and everyone deserves to play. Okay, uh, another one of our Atari collections. Um, this is the Court and Barbara Allen uh, Atari packaging design collection. So um, it's over 2,000 drawings, photograph, pr photographs, proofs, uh, package mock-ups, um, drafts of manual scripts, unused packaging, box flats, designs, and other documents that um, really give you a picture of, of how the packaging was designed and produced. Um, and this um, dates are uh, 1976 through 1984 for this collection, um, but it um, covers uh, games for uh, Atari 400, 800, 2600, and 5200. Um, some of Pong um, consoles and Atari's Touch Me. We have like a schematic for the original Pong. Yeah. So this is again a, an, another a heavily used collection because a lot of people have come to us researching how how games were marketed and the design of, of the packaging and the you know the art that was involved. And of course, this being a Nintendo property, uh, they hired Atari to make these games for their home consoles. Uh, so we um. Um, one of the things that we're um, collecting more in now um, is uh, uh, press kits and company newsletters. So um, a lot of the company newsletters we end up getting through the corporate collections, archival collections that we get in, um, but we're um, trying to purchase or um, acquire um, press kits. So this is what you would take out to um, as a salesman to market to um, at this point in the you know 80s and 90s, this is what you would take to to Walmart or to Sears or to Kmart, um, and you have there's some of these kits have pictures of how you would set up your display. So we've got a lot of pictures of old Sears, which is <laughs> um, which is really interesting. And um, so one of our older ones we just acquired is a press kit from Activision, and it's got my. Um, greatest American hero in there. Um, I'm not sure what he has to do with Pitfall, but there he is. Um, and we also, over on the far side there, is a press kit for um, the uh, Four Horsemen, uh, which was a game uh, developed by 3DO. Um, it's Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, uh, but it was completed right before um, the company went out of business. And uh, so this is a press kit for something that never actually made it to market, so it's really interesting. Big thing that we have, Japanese game collection. Back in 2013, and I'm going to talk fast because we're running out of time slowly, <laughs> uh, we acquired a collection of over 7,000 Japanese games, all complete in the box with their manuals. Complete or nearly complete libraries of the Famicom, Super Famicom. 
the disk system, the Nintendo 64, the Virtual Boy, the 64DD, GameCube, uh, Master System, Game Gear, Mega Drive, 32X, Mega CD, Sega Saturn, Dreamcast, PC Engine, Super Graphics, PCFX, and to top it all off, a collection of Pioneer Laser Active Laser Discs. Uh, again, all of this is accessible if you come, you make a research appointment, I'll pull out whatever game you want to play. Okay. Um, one of my personal favorites, obviously, uh, Ken and Roberta Williams Sierra Online Collection. So, um, similar to other design collections that I've been talking about, you have, um, you know, Roberta's notes on the, you know, King's Quest games. You have artwork. There's uh, photographs of um, employees in their offices, and there's memos. There's um, newsletters, correspondence, just. Um, everything that somebody who loves the perils of Rosella would love. Ralph Bear, the father of video games. Right, so we have a Ralph Bear collection, um, a lot of uh, correspondence, um, game designs. This is, he's one of the ones that would, um, he learned early on that to date every single piece of paper that he wrote on so that nobody could go back and say that it was their idea first for these things. So He learned through lawsuits. He learned through lawsuits. Um, so again, product description, schematics, um, manuals that he used, um, some of the drafts of his autobiography, um, and you All can right. talk about, yeah. So this is actually his desk from yes. his Florida home, as it was kind of set up back in the day. Ralph Bear was a good friend to the museum, so unfortunately it was before that I was there. But they met with him, they took pictures, they know what his desk looked like. This was his desk. And there's his shoes on There's his desk. shoes, there's his <laughs> cardigan. Yeah. But this is probably one of the more interesting items. Uh, so light guns, we've heard a controversy about them over this past couple of days. Uh, and they're many times tied to military and warfare. It may not be a surprise to us that the military was interested in video games. Uh, Ralph Bear created this prototype light gun, the only one that we know of in existence in 1979, that works pretty much like the light guns work today in that they uh, use the scan lines of the TV to detect where things are moving on the screen. Uh, what's great about this is it's actually a decommissioned light anti-tank weapon, a real thing that was used. Uh, and not only that, but he brought this light anti-tank weapon to a general, uh, two-star general at the Pentagon and basically sold them on the fact that video games can be used to help train soldiers, uh, and which earned the company he was working at a contract to do just that. And there's so much more that there's we can so talk about. Uh, we talked about Butterfly Garden. We have, just the exhibits. Yeah, we have Sesame Street. You can, Wegmans. where is Sesame Street? Wegmans, Wegmans. Wegmans. you can come shopping. Uh, Snoopy, that's the Toy Hall of Fame up top. We have pinball machines, arcade machines. More stuff in the archives than you can possibly imagine. That's right. We wrote uh, we wrote a book, <laughs> History of Video Games and 64 Objects. So um, please, it has uh, photographs of items from our collection, um, really well done essays. Um, you can um, buy it wherever books are sold. And some of them are very unique. It's not just yeah. okay. We're covering the Nintendo. We have a Nintendo from Nintendo where they showed the insides <laughs> of the system. So there's a lot of interesting objects. Uh, we also have our Women in Games initiative in our exhibit. Uh, so we want to tell the untold stories from women in the gaming industry and not just the people at the top. Yes, we like to hear the stories from people like Bonnie Ross from 343 Industries who's in charge of Halo, but we also want to cover things that you may not know about, including the women who are working to actually manufacture all these games. And we have video footage of just that from, of course, our Atari collection. Uh, and our exhibit opened. Uh, you can see a picture of it down here. We have a screen that features all the sections. And one of my favorite memories of the we held an event to open up our Women in Games exhibit. We had uh, people like Bonnie Ross, Amy Hennig, Donna Bailey, Brenda Laurel, and more come and actually give a talk to over 200 people in the audience plus people on Twitch. Uh, and this is the first time that they met. It was really cool. But one of my favorites was uh, Amy Hennig. Uh, I caught her as she was watching the video on the wall where it's talking about her career a little bit. It was, it was a really cool thing. There's a lot of people like, you don't want to be like, oh, my stuff belongs in a museum. Uh, no, and it's just seeing these people interact. And then the next day, they had very small uh, conversations with students from RIT who we're, we're very close to. And they were able to talk about what it's like to be in the game industry and specifically what it's like to be a woman in the industry. They all had different stories to tell. That's on YouTube if you'd like to go see the whole talk, uh, and it's totally worth a watch. Uh, we also have an app, uh, the original mobile games. We have 
tons of puzzles and other things that lead up to video games, some of them being 150 plus years old almost, and we decided to recreate these in an app form. It's free, uh, you can download it. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the name rec recognition, we're not, you know, somebody pu putting out big games. But we work with RIT, who helped make the prototype, and also a company called Second Avenue Learning, who's in Rochester. Uh, they do a, a lot of games like Martha Madison, which again, helps children learn video games and learn other things. And this recreates the game in playable form. All those games where you're rolling the ball around, trying to get them in the different holes and put them in all these areas. The games that you would probably spend a solid hour on if you, I just left one out here. You can play it on your phone. It's you free. Play that at the dentist when you had your fluoride rating, <laughs> you had the rolly thing. And not only did we re recreate the old experience of these games, but there's also you could pay three or four dollars with a microtransaction and get uh, tons more puzzles. They're really great. They have backstories. They have high resolution pictures. They're awesome. And I do a Twitch stream called Game Saves from the Strong. If you can't get to Rochester, I understand. I would like you to come, but I understand. I take you behind the scenes. This is a prototype called Dawn of Man, which is actually the earliest known uh, surviving prototype of Age of Empires, which is from our Bruce Shelley collection who helped make the game. And we have design documents and all this stuff to go with it. Uh, looks very different than Age of Empires, but I take you kind of behind the scenes and let you see some of the things that you may not get to experience otherwise. And with that, that is our contact information uh, and our Twitter information. We both yes. tweet quite a bit, me probably more than you. Yes. Uh, and if there's any <laughs> questions, we'd be happy to answer. I think we have like five have minutes like five left, minutes but we'll okay. hang, hang out wherever. So I'm sure you probably get this question a lot. What's the uh, crown jewel of the collection? Or top three? <sighs> I mean, we always point to the doll that uh, Margaret Woodbury Strong had growing up. She would carry it around with her. Uh, it's something that, you, you know, you can't place a value on, but it actually has her hair. One of the popular things that rich people with dolls would do is they'd take their hair and put... They, when they get their first haircut, they would then t use that hair to make a wig for your doll. But we also have perhaps <laughs> one of the earliest Monopoly boards yes. in Charlie the world. Uh, so it's actually round, we think, because the, his kitchen table was round, and he used like the molding from his house to, to cut up to make you know the houses and right. hotels and everything. I know we have like two minutes, yeah. five minutes, something like that. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, my um, one of my favorite uh, items in the in the archival collection is um, there was um, a memo in the SSI. <laughs> Call it, I call it the BO memo. It was this memo written from what, some woman in the office that, like saying, all right, gentlemen, remember that it's, you know, I shouldn't have to tell you this. Your mother should be telling you this, that, you know, to shower and wear deodorant. <laughs> and the office is small, so that's so, um, that's one of my, it's just, you know, it's all the, it's something that just is the, a perfect snapshot of, of a culture. I like it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, real fast, um, do you work or compete with like private people that are doing this? Because like by me, there's uh, Marvin's Marvelous um, Magnus <laughs> Museum, where they've got old machines from back in like 1914 on the boardwalks and stuff like that. Like, do you usually work with people like that, or? We, when we can, um, a lot of times, sometimes, especially in buying the arcade games, we're probably competing against some people yeah. <laughs> uh, to, to get some collections. I know there's a couple of people I lose to on, on eBay all the time. Um, but, but when we say that like we're open, like if that person wanted to come and learn from us, we'd give okay. them opportunities to learn. Like, yes, we get it. They probably have stuff we don't, yeah. but we have stuff they don't. So Yeah, so I would, yeah, I'd say that we we would love to work with people and, um, you know, we all the more learning, the merrier. The more the Marrier, and one other sub-question, yeah. uh, have you found Polybius yet or no? No, it doesn't, the, the, the FBI prevents me from talking about that game, <laughs> sorry. Ah, uh, yeah. Technically, they're closed right now. So I, that is know. true. <laughs> I, I guess then a percentage of your budget, museum budget, does go towards bidding on things on eBay. Yep. Yeah. Um, the Activision press kit. I want to know, can I pretend that I lose every option to you guys? <laughs> Whatever makes you if feel you better. Are, yeah, just you tell me when you're, you're then I'll say yeah. that you, that I added you. Yeah. Okay. Um, in addition to uh, regular toys and uh, video games, do you pre preserve um, redemption games? Like you find like arcades, like crate games? And we have a couple. Uh, we have a representative sample of some of those sorts of things, but a lot of them are kind of the same. Now, as we go back older, there's a lot of interesting, uh, again, electromechanical games where you know it's a different experience. Uh, we definitely have some, but it's harder to uh, 
find we would like to find I think the unique ones right. that uh, are important. Yeah. Are there any particular gaps, like things that you're trying to find? That... Yeah. Well, from the from the library uh, perspective, we're definitely our our trade catalog collection. Um, we are really solid 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. So our collection uh, focus is really um, before 1960, um, because a lot of those are catalogs are, are harder to find, um, and there's a lot of companies that don't exist anymore. So. Um, and just to quickly end on our stuff, uh, games outside of the United States are always hard, especially in Europe. Uh, you're looking at uh, Eastern European countries. That would be stuff that we'd love to have. Uh, indie games is something that I'm working on right now, knowing that indie games are a huge part of what I play, and I'm sure it's a huge part of what you play, uh, but they are also very quick to disappear, so we want to preserve those things. And we have a few good indie game collections that we'll talk about, uh, but I do think we're out of time. We're going to hang around. Uh, we have business cards if you need more information, but we want to make sure other people can set up. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>